How's my family doing today? Oh, golly, I'm just so full of the Lord right now. I got saved again today, you guys. So, anyway, nobody wants to clap for my salvation. Wow. I think that's a big deal, if you ask me. But, anyway... But uh, welcome to the house, man. If you're just joining us for the first time, again, thank you for coming and sharing your uh, Sunday morning with us. You know, I truly believe that this is the day that the Lord has made, and I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord. I love church. I love coming on Wednesdays and Sundays. Uh, it's one of my favorite times uh, that I get to be around all of you guys. Uh, well, today, uh, we are concluding our series on the end times entitled Unprepared. And what we've been doing is we've been taking a look at what God's Word has to say about the end times, because we want you to be prepared, not unprepared, for the coming of the, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I believe that we're living in the end times, and if, if you don't think we're living in the end times, I believe we're, we're at the beginning phases of the end time, uh, because Jesus is the one who says in Matthew 24, he says, there are six signs, six things that are going to be happening, and when you see these things happening, then you know that my time is near. And uh, so I think that Jesus could be coming back at any time. So as a pastor, again, I want to make sure that you guys are aware, those of you who are Christ followers, to know what God's Word has to say about it. And in case you get left behind, uh, I want you to know about what God's Word has to say about what's going to be going on uh, during the end times. Uh, so, so far we took a look at those six signs. Week number two, I gave you a review of the book of Revelation, an overview of the book of Revelation. Week three, we took a look at the rapture, you know, this, and then week four, we took a look at the second coming, uh, uh, the second coming of Christ, and then week five, uh, we took a look what the Bible has to say about hell, and then last week, we took a look what the Bible has to say about heaven, and again, if you missed any of those weeks, again, you can go to our YouTube channel or our app to catch up on those things, but today, as we conclude our series, I want to talk to you about what is it that God wants me to do until that time. Whether I die today, tomorrow, 20 years from now, I go in the rapture, the second coming, what am I supposed to do until it's my time to stand before God? And I want to show you, not through my opinion, but through scripture, that if you're a Christ follower, you cannot get away from this. That there is something that God has called every Christian on the planet that we are called to do something. So if you would go ahead and turn in your Bible uh, to Matthew chapter 24, uh, verses 12 through 14. Uh, now again, this is one of the first passages we took a look at in week number one, so I just thought it was fitting to take a look at it at the end. Uh, understand uh, that uh, the Gospels, this is one of the Gospels, Matthew is, is, is in the New Testament, it's the first book of the New Testament. It's also uh, one of the four Gospels, so there's an account of Jesus' life. So whenever you study Scripture, there, when you read stories and stuff, there are people who heard about something and they write about it. There are people who, who saw it and they experienced it and they wrote about it. And then there were people who actually lived it and they wrote about it. So here when it comes to the Gospels, again, they are accounts of some of Jesus' closest followers. Now, not only did they experience for themselves, they lived it with him. They lived it with Jesus. So this is an account of Jesus talking about those six things that are going to happen, and then we know that his return is near. It's towards the end, and it says in verse 12, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Now, again, we know that towards the end, there's going to be a lot of bad that is going to happen. In fact, especially wickedness amongst Believers, like, like, like this concerns me as a pastor because there are people that are walking away from their faith. And whenever we shut down the church for 15 weeks, uh, man, it hurt people. It did hurt people. There are people that still haven't recovered from it. New believers that were calling me saying, listen, I need you to open church again. Marriages, God's telling me, man, I'm the, man, it's for the first time in my life, I'm in the spiritual leader, I'm bringing my family to church, we're praying together, and three, I need you to open a church. It's like, it's like there's still things, and there's, during this whole time that we were shut down, I was thinking, God, I wonder how they're doing. I wonder if they're reading their Bible. I wonder if they're praying. I wonder, I wonder how they're doing on their struggles. I wonder if they have anybody reaching out to them. I did the best I could, but I couldn't get to everybody. 
But, but I was concerned because right now in this moment, we see this very thing playing out. We see Christians, believers, the love of them, their heart towards God, their passion towards God is going away. They quit going to church. They quit serving church or they quit serving God. They don't even serve God outside of the church. They just, they're just, their hearts are growing cold. And it concerns me as a pastor. But we see this playing, going, playing out right now. And then he says, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And I did the best I could last week to bring an encouraging message about heaven, that even though we're going through all the despair and all the turmoil, that we still have a promise in heaven for those who endure to the end. Amen? That's our hope that we have. But many places when you read scripture, when it talks about the end time, there's a lot of bad things that happen, but there's also another dynamic that's going on that people don't know about. Because to be honest with you, when it comes to the gospel, the gospel usually works the best. God usually moves the most during crisis, during problems. And we actually have the one thing that is working. So what does God want me to do until the end, until it's my time? He tells us in in the next part of this verse. He says, and the gospel of the kingdom will be preached. If you want to know what God has called you to do, he's called you to preach the gospel. To preach the gospel to the very end. I love it, meaning there's nothing that's going to stop the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is, so, and the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Again, so not only during the, during the last days will we see uh, wickedness begin to happen, we'll begin to see people fall away from God, but we're also going to see a move of God. And again, it's one of the many reasons that I believe that we're living in the beginning stages of the end, if we're not in the end times, because numerically, we're in the greatest revival generation of ever. Like whenever you study, if you, for all 2,020 years... Okay, over the last, there have been more people come to know Christ over the last 40 years than the previous 1980 years. Like, like that just shows that the gospel is being dominated right now. Could it be that God is trying to tell us something? I think so. I'm getting ready to come. So I need the gospel to be preached to the end of the earth and then the end will come. So Matthew 24, 12 and 14 is telling what Jesus is telling us is, listen, there is a danger that during the end times of Christians that are going to fall away. But guess what? There's also an opportunity for people to have faith in me. That, that there's an opportunity for people who aren't Christians to become Christians, for people to be saved. Now, again, due to COVID, there's a problem with the second one. It's, it's really hard for people to come to church. It just is like for us, man, we're just trying to do everything we can to have church, to make it to where it's clean, it's sterile. We're, we're, we're uh, basically, we're monitoring this week by week. We might have to go back to two service depending on our volunteers. It's like we're trying to do everything that we can, all right, to, to get just us just to have church. Now, I recently saw a stat that said 47% of people before COVID, would not come to church for no reason at all. It's like they would never step foot in the church. And it's even higher now through the COVID. So what that tells me is this. If we're not going to be able to reach people in the room, we got to be able to find a way to reach people out of the room. It's like we got to be about the fourth part of our mission, about being the church. Yeah, God said, don't forsake the gathering of people. We need to come to church. The church has got to go on. But we as Christ followers, we need to leave the four walls, and we need to go be the church in our everyday lives that God has called us to preach the gospel. And the problem with this is many people have a hard time with this because you think, well, you're telling me that I'm an evangelist. Mm. No, well, you're not, uh, but, but, but understand what I'm saying, that, that the reason why you think you're not an evangelist, though, is because you have this stereotype of what evangelist is. Many of you have probably had a bad experience with him, like, like you had that guy that stood on the, on the street corner with a boombox just yelling at people saying, you're all going to hell. Or you think of an evangelist, somebody that goes from town to town setting up these tent revivals. 
Again, although I do believe that God has called evangelists, there are evangelists that God has anointed, and he has called to go do that. Listen, I'm not saying that although everybody's not called to be an evangelist, everybody is called to evangelize, to be evangelism. That is what God wants us to do. That is what you cannot escape. If you call yourself a Christ follower, God has called you to evangelize. And whenever you study evangelism out through scripture, you know what it actually means? The evangelism is, the English word for evangelism in the Bible is the gospel. It's the good news. And then whenever you start doing the word search, when you break down what the gospel is in the Greek, it, it, it's a, it says a yengalian. Oh, that was really good. I don't ever pronounce them things right. Eugalian. So the EU is where we get the part for eulogy. And that's where I got some good news to say. It's like, I'm at a funeral. I'm going to bring the eulogy. I'm going to tell some good things about this person. The angelion, that's where we get angel. Okay, so, so meaning that it's not just a good message, but it's a good messenger. Okay, so, so in other words, it's not just a good message that it is, evangelism. But there has to be a good messenger. And, and many theologians, this word evangelism is so hard to translate. There's like, well, is it the message or is it the messenger? I'm here to tell you it's both. Because you can have the best message in the world, but if you don't have the messenger, then nobody's going to hear it to begin with. But you can have the right messenger and have the wrong message, and nobody's going to listen to it. But how many of you know that we have the best message on the planet amongst COVID, amongst the election, amongst despair, amongst everything that is going on? The gospel is the only thing that works. And we have it. So what God has called us to do to the very end, he has called us to be a message and to carry the good message forward. He called us to evangelize, not to be an evangelist, to evangelize. That's good preaching. So this is what I want to do. I want to give us, um, I want to talk about what does it mean to be a good messenger and what is, it, what is the message? What is the good message then? Uh, if you'll turn to Isaiah 52, 7. And again, I love this because this is God talking to Isaiah and he's just painting a picture and God is talking about, listen, I think it's so beautiful. And he's not talking about a church, he's talking about people leaving a church. And he says, man, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings. Again, there's a difference between the good news and good tidings. Who proclaim salvation and say to everyone that our or your God reigns. Again, it's like, it's like our God reigns. He's not nervous. He's not freaking out. Like God is still on the throne and he's still in control. Can I get an amen? It's like God is saying how beautiful this is to those who carry the good news who proclaim peace, who proclaim good tidings, and who proclaim salvation. And then I can see Jesus getting frustrated about this, especially in Luke chapter 2. This is what Jesus said. He told him, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So like Jesus saying, listen, there's not a harvest problem. I have a worker problem. It's like there are people out there who if somebody would pray with them, they would welcome it. There are people out there that are hungry, that if somebody would feed them, they would welcome it. There's people out there that are lonely, and if somebody would just call or text the person I put on your mind and your brain, they wouldn't be as lonely. You know what? There are people out there that, that, that would get saved if people would give them an invitation. It's like, it's like, so God's saying, Jesus is frustrated here. He's saying, listen, you've got the best message in the world. I need some messengers. I need some people that will carry the gospel. And the problem is, though, is because that wickedness has happened, and the love of many believers is growing cold towards me. So then he goes on and says, so when you pray, ask the Father to send messengers, to send workers. And I'm here to tell you again, Christ followers, if you are a Christ follower, God has commissioned you and appointed you to preach the gospel to the very end of age, to evangelize the world. So I want to give you four things then. Four things when it comes to being a good messenger. The first thing, guys, you have to accept the personal responsibility. This has to become personal. 
How many of you know that it became personal for God when he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for you? It became personal. you got to understand that you are God's plan to reach humanity. You are God's plan to reach your community, to reach your job, to reach your family. There, there is nobody. God does not have a plan B. Like, you're it. You know what? If this thing doesn't work, he's not going to reappear again and go to the cross. He already did it. He said, you guys are it. And you have to take the personal responsibility that I'm a Christ follower, and God has given me the, 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 the task to be the messenger to carry his message. Romans 10, 13 through 15. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And then how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why scripture says, and then I love, he repeats Isaiah 52, 7, which is so cool. He says, how beautiful are the feet of of messengers who bring evangelism. You see the good news? The gospel. The people who evangelize. They leave the church and they go be the hands and feet of me. People are ready. People are ready. What that means, because evangelism does not mean that you're going to have to go on a street corner and preach unless you want to do that. Listen, evangelizing Lord, what it means is that you're just going to wake up every day and you're going to go about your everyday life and you're going to look for people who are in need. You're going to look for people who are hurt. You're going to look for people who need the message that you have because they're out there. Listen, you're just not going to work to make money. Listen, God has a divine appointment for you. He's going to put somebody in your path. Remember, you woke up on purpose with a purpose. You've got to accept this personal responsibility. Your walk has got to become personal. You know, I feel a lot of phone calls. I'm in a position as a pastor that we help a lot of people out. In our church and outside of our church. In the last two or three months, there's people hurting. There's a desperate need out there. COVID is on the rise. Schools are closing down. It's like people are needing their, their bills. Parents, parents are having to quit their job to stay home and teach their kids. 129 kids got sent home from the junior high, so parents have to make a decision where they're going to continue to work or, or are teenagers going to stay home unsupervised. It's like there is, a, there is a dire need that is going on, and here's the truth. I've never had anybody reject when I started sharing the gospel with them. And not one time in every phone call that I've ever had, I pray with everybody before I get off the phone. I've never, when I said, hey, can I pray for you? Not one time have I ever had anybody tell me no. Again, what does that mean? Is that people are searching, people are looking, and you have the answer. We just got to take it responsible. The second thing is we have to develop a personal relationship. Now, again, this is where I think people miss it because I think they think the second part of evangelism is this is when we start telling them how much we know. This is when we start telling people all the knowledge and everything about the Bible and just, just we just start going on and on about the Bible and we start telling them everything that they're doing wrong. Listen, people do not care what you know. They want to know that you care. Okay? And man, early on in my walk with Christ, I had a lot of zeal, I had a lot of hunger, a a, a lot of knowledge, but I was ignorant. And what I mean by that is I literally got in a lot of debates with people. I could not wait to debate and prove people wrong through Scripture. Like I went to college looking to debate Mormons and atheists and Buddhists and everybody that I could. And when I became a youth leader in my youth group at the time, I kid you not, we took kids on a Friday night to Royal Twin Theater here in Paul's Valley, and you might have you might have been one of the ones. You might have came out of the theater, and we were like, hey, do you know Jesus? And if they said no, we said, you're going to hell. Oh, it's funny, but it's true. You know how many people we ever saved? Zero. You know how many people got discipled? Zero. You know how many people I turned away from God? Every one. Listen, it's so wrong when it comes to this because when you begin to study Jesus' life, hear this, Jesus never corrected before he connected. 
Jesus always connected with people before he corrected people. Listen, you've got to earn the right to connect or to correct somebody. You've got to earn the right. You just can't, nobody's just going to listen to you just because you think that you're knowledgeable. Jesus always connected before he corrected. You ever been around people that just give you unsolicited information without you asking? How does it make you feel? I want to punch them. No, I'm just joking. I don't mind if you come tell me stuff. I'm just joking. But I just want to say, brother, I didn't ask you. Matter of fact, how are you doing? I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, y'all know the story of Zacchaeus in the Bible? I love Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Wee little man was he. All right? But he was a bad man. He was a mean person. He was evil. He stole from people. He robbed people. Like, he just stole from people. People, everybody knew he was evil. But he had enough. He so was hungry to see God that he went ahead and he climbed a tree just to see Jesus. And guess what? When Jesus got to him and underneath, he didn't look up at Zacchaeus and say, Hey, you're going to hell. You know what? You're a bad person, Zacchaeus. He didn't do that. You know what he did? He asked him, he said, hey, Zacchaeus, how about you come down from that tree with me and let's go eat at Norma's and eat one of them big five-pound burritos. Mm. Let's go to Baker's Pizza and tear about a large pepperoni and supreme. (laughs) No, he didn't didn't say that. He said, well, what he said was, Zacchaeus, how about you come down from the tree and let's go to your house and let's eat. And the Bible doesn't record that conversation, but I would love to have been there because all we know is that when Zacchaeus left, the Bible says that he he gave back three times of everything that he took and his life was changed. I'm here to tell you, if we'll just connect before we correct, we'll change people's lives for the kingdom of God. So we have to develop a personal relationship with people. Listen to 1 Corinthians 9.22. Whatever a person is like, I try to find common ground with him so that he will let me tell him about Christ And let Christ save him. John Maxwell says this. I don't have to be like them to reach them. But I do have to like them. I just think that's funny. And then the third thing. We need to share a personal story. Again, many people think this is where I take out the Bible. And I start telling them all the things that they need to change about their life. This is when I need to start telling them. Well, your life would be better if you quit doing that. Listen, that's not the gospel. See, the gospel, the the message of the gospel is not that what you tell people what they need to change. The gospel is what you tell people how it changed you. How it changed you. And God has called us to share our personal invitation or our personal story with people. And you know what? I correct from the pulpit with God's word. But whenever you see me out and I'm evangelizing to people, I don't even talk about people's issues. I don't bring up their issues. I don't bring up their sin. I was like, listen, man, can I just tell you about how Jesus changed my life? And I share my story with them. And that's it. And then I just listen for the Holy Spirit and wait for opportunities for this next part here. But we'll read the scripture first, 1 Peter 3, 15, 16. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect, meaning don't get an argument with them about it. How do you get in an argument when you just share your story? It's when you start breaking out scripture and start debating people is when you get in arguments. It says, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. And then leads to the fourth thing, which is then you need to give a personal invitation And some of you that are really skilled and really knowledgeable, it's okay for you to say, hey, would you like to give your life to Jesus? Some of you that know the Roman road, you know what's cool? We're going to start a class, and we're going to teach people how to share their faith. And you're actually going to get to come and practice how to lead somebody to Christ, which is really cool. I really thought about asking Carrie to come up here, and then I could save her. I used to do that with our youth group. It was pretty fun. I mean, all kinds of stuff came out of that. But you ask them, give them a personal invitation. Then you know what? Maybe you don't know how to lead them to Christ. Maybe you don't know what to say. Invite them to church. 
And you don't have to say, hey, you want to come to church. This is what you tell them. So what are you doing Sunday? You want to go to a house party? You give away gluten-free, sugar-free donuts are going to be there. Fat-free. B12 coffee, loose calories while you drink it. But man, there's going to be this awesome band. And then this dude gets up and yells like he's cool and wears skinny jeans sometimes. He's so lost. You want to come and make fun of him with me? I'll invite them to church. Get them in front of me. I'll tell them about Jesus. Or how about the third thing? How about get involved in a small group? How about we have a, a right now media resource that is free to you, that has thousands and thousands of videos and curriculum that you can open up your home and invite a small group over. John Maxwell, uh, he just put together a small group video curriculum. And what John Maxwell does, he, he's, he's a sought-out speaker. He goes into these corporations, and he shares about leadership and about life, and he helps people just become better people. And whenever he comes into this corporation, what he does is when he's done, he's like, okay, I just shared with you about business. If you'll come back in 15 minutes, I'll share my faith with you. And then he really shares the four, the four faces of God, what they're not, what he's not, and then who he is. And he said 50% of people that come back get saved. So how cool is it if you business people or you guys that have an hour lunch break say, hey, you guys, you guys be interested in learning how we can be better leaders? Maybe better business people to come and check out this small group curriculum by John Maxwell? Hey, and then you know what? John Maxwell, the sixth week, will be like, hey, if you guys come back next week, I'll share my faith with you. And then you allow John Maxwell to share his faith with them. And then somebody that you invited that didn't know Christ through a business meeting, here's the gospel and get saved. This thing does not have to be hard. It really doesn't. But the one thing is that we have got to take it serious. So, so, the, so that's the message. You want to be a good messenger? Man, we have to take responsibility, guys. We have to take true ownership of that. We have to develop a relationship with them. You got to share your personal story. Don't preach at them and then give them an invitation. So what's the message then? What's this message about? Isaiah 52, 7 again says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation and say, Our God reigns. So the first message, and it's not cliche, it's still true today, is that God loves you and he sent his son to pay for your sins. That's good news. Like, like, people need to hear that. People need to hear that God loves them. People need to hear John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Again, people need to hear that God loves them. I need to hear that God loves me. I don't mind if you tell me, hey, Pastor B, God loves you. Like, thank you for the reminder. You know what else needs to hear it? Atheists need to hear that God loves them. You're like, what do you mean? They don't even believe in God. No, but they miss God. They might not believe, but they're looking for God. And here's the truth. Inside of every human, inside of every human being on the planet, God placed something inside of them saying that they were created in, the, in his image. That there is an unredeemed spirit inside of each and every one of us. That there's this God-sized hole inside of every single human on the planet. That we can fill it with all kinds of stuff we want to. But it will never be filled because it is a God-sized hole that can only be filled by God-sized love. We have a response. We have the message to tell people. It's the best news in the world that God loves you and he sent his son to die for your sins. The second thing. God tells us to proclaim peace. What does that mean? That God can give you peace no matter the circumstance. Did you know that? That God can give you peace no matter what you're going through, no matter what the storm is going on in your life. I think some of you need to hear that today, that God will give you peace. Everything is broken. Everything is going on. But God can give you peace no matter the circumstance. He says, the peace that I give you is not of this world. The peace I give you is beyond comprehension. And listen to John 16, 33. It says, I've told you, I've told you this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I've overcame the world. And you know, I've overcame the world, but you can have peace no matter what's going on because the reality is there's some things in this world we cannot control. 
I told a family this past Friday who God was knitting this beautiful little baby girl, Karis, in her mommy's belly for 14 weeks. She was her own person. She had a heartbeat. We saw the heartbeat. She had little toes, little hands, little characteristics. And she ended up passing. I told her family, listen, I'm so sorry you're going through this. I wish I could take it away from you. But I can't, but I promise you, if you will look, you will find God's peace. A peace that surpasses your very own understanding. I can't explain it, but that peace will be there. Do you know that God had a plan for that little girl? Because there are five people that threw that little girl, two of them came to church today. Do you know that? I'm here to tell you God can give you peace because COVID's going up. You're losing your job. Your marriage, you can have peace that surpasses our very own understanding. The third thing, the good tidings when you study in Hebrew, what it means is that God can give you strength to make it through it. That's the good news. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're doing, God can give you strength to get through. How about you just walk around your community? God can give you strength to get through it. I don't know what you're dealing with, but God can give you strength to get through it. Oh, you lost your job? Listen, God can give you the strength to get through it. Oh, your marriage is struggling? Listen, God, God can give you the strength to get over that. Oh, you you're have depression right now? Listen, God can give you strength to get through that. Oh, you're struggling with alcohol? Listen, God can give you strength to get over that. See, you have the greatest message in the world that God can give you strength to get over it. 2 Corinthians 4.3, it says, If the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed but not driven to despair. We are hunted down but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Listen, you might be going through it, but you're not destroyed. You might be pressed, but you're not destroyed. You might be perplexed, but you're not destroyed. You might be sick, but you're not destroyed. If you have life, if you are breathing and you're alive today, the enemy's going to come at you, but he can't destroy you. If God is for you, who can be against you? Who can be against you? We're going to face trials. Things are going to come at us. We're going to get knocked down, but we got to pick ourselves back up. Why? Because God can give us strength to get through it. See, the truth is that God loves us, and he sent Jesus to pay for our sins. The truth is God can give us a peace that surpasses our very own understanding. And the truth is that God, no matter what you go through in this world, God is going to help us get through it. And then the fourth thing, when it comes to the message, the greatest message we have on the planet, he said to proclaim, proclaim salvation. What does that mean, Pastor B? It means that God's ready to save you right now. He's ready. He's ready to save you right now. And the way I picture it is, is a man who jumps off of a ship or falls off a ship and he's out in the middle of the ocean. And he's swimming, he's screaming, asking for help. And then he sees a man up on the ship, it's Jesus. And Jesus, he has his little lifesaver here. And he's saying, listen, you know what? I have what you need. Just, just call out to me. I'll give it to you. You know what Jesus told me? He said, brave people would rather drown in their sorrow than to trust me with their life. People, I'm, I'm here, I have a lifesaver. People would rather try to handle it on their own. People want to bury stuff down. Jesus said, no, no, listen, you have to invite me. I'm ready to save you. You just have to invite me in. I'll never force myself on you. But if you'll just let me, I'll save you. See, Jesus is ready to save people right now. Jesus went to the cross so we can save people right now. Romans 10, 9, How? It says, if the good news, or it says that if we confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believed and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confessed and are saved. See, it starts with making him Lord of your life. You surrender your life to him. And I want to end with sharing my story with you wanted me to share my story with you. I don't share it unless God really 
puts it on my heart. He wanted me to end this series to share my story with you. He wanted me to evangelize. And if you heard it, I apologize. But my message is for you out here in the world. I got saved at 22 years old. 40 years old now. I had the most amazing family growing up, the most amazing mom and dad. They loved me, there for me. I was athletic, I loved sports, I had friends. Everything was great. And then something happened to me when I was little. I was abused and molested by some babysitters. It was very real. I know even today, my mom and dad still struggle. They kind of blame themselves with it, but mom and dad, stuff like that happens to your kid. You might not even know what's wrong. But as I grew up and the older I got, and I realized what happened to me, I got angry bitter you know I'd even go to church and I would hear of a, of a loving God who will love you and will protect you not me what I do God just a little kid what, what did I do I deserve that and I leave there broken to think that I'm ashamed and I'm worthless and this is just what you deserve this enemy's the father of lies right and then I remember going to church when I finally, okay, say yes to Jesus. Then I'd hear a pastor try to create an expectation for me and all these rules and regulations. But because I didn't talk right and I still had behavioral issues and all this stuff, see, they, they cared more about my behavior than my heart. And I became lost and broken and really mad at God. I walked away. I don't know if I ever really came to him, but I was done with God. Went to college. Started drinking partying it up still playing baseball college baseball just living the good life telling God I hate you you're not real like I was there just just wishing just threatening do something me and my buddies went out drinking all night one night is one of my last baseball games in the summer my sophomore year is supposed to sign a full ride scholarship two weeks Got drunk all night, hung over. Guy hit my knee, blew it out, lost a scholarship. That was my last year I got to play baseball in college. My girlfriend and I broke up at the time, and I found myself at the very bottom of my life. Broken, depressed, an alcoholic. And I found myself not even wanting to live anymore. 22 years old in my mom's house with a gun wanting to take my life. And it wasn't because I didn't love life. It wasn't because I didn't love my mom and dad. I was just so tired of waking up every day and wanting to die. The pain was real. It couldn't escape. It wasn't real. I felt so worthless. I had no meaning in my life. And in that moment, I went to church enough and I realized I cried. I said, God, I want you to either save my life or take my life. Because I don't want to do this anymore. And I said, Lord, if you'll save me, I'll surrender my life to you. And for the rest of my life, whatever platform you give me, that I'll give it for you. And I think right then I got saved. I don't know, but what I tell people is that next Sunday, that very next day, our pastor didn't need to preach. There didn't need to be a worship service. I came to church for one reason. Because I couldn't wait for the invitation. I ran down. I didn't lift my hand. I ran down to the front. I was the only one. And I said yes to God. And I surrendered my life to Him. And I started dancing around. I went from a back row Christian to a front row Christian. I had no idea what I was doing. I just knew all the people around me during worship were, were dancing around and moving. I knew I liked to dance. So I was started shaking my booty with them and lifting my hands and going crazy. Although I didn't know what I was doing, I was growing in God. Yeah, I surrendered yes to Jesus. I made him Lord of my life and things begin to change. Things begin to heal. Six months later, after I got saved, I got baptized. And I got to tell you, there's something happened to me when I got baptized because it was the day I overcame immorality because as soon as I got home, my girlfriend at the time tried to become intimate with me and I said, no, there's something different about me. I'm here to tell you if you're ready to get baptized, you need to get baptized December 6th. There's something that's going to happen to you. 
And then I went to this encounter and remember that molestation has always been there and it's always been on my back. And it's always, every time something happened, the enemy would always throw that up in my face. And there was this time for inner healing. And I went to an encounter and I came down there. And it was the first time I shared with another man what happened to me. And it began to cry literally for two hours after the service was over. We were doing inner healing. And I promise you, supernaturally, God took me to that room when all that was going on. And the whole time God's arm was open, he was crying out to me. He was begging for me to come to his arms. He was, the whole time I was mad. And in that one moment, I saw that there was a loving God that Satan tried to kill, steal, and destroy me. But God had another plan in me for my life. Can I get an amen? Because Satan wanted to steal my life. God wanted to use my life. And in a second, I forgave that person. He said, listen, you're going to have to forgive that person who hurt you. And I didn't want to do it. I wanted to kill him. I wanted to die. I wanted to, I wanted him to burn. But in a moment when I said, I forgive you, and I ran out his name and I forgive him and I released it. Man, I felt the weight come off of me and I jumped up and started running around the building and I knew that I was changed. I knew that I was different. And from that moment, listen, I can't tell you what God's going to do that in your life. All I know is that God changed my life. It's his love that changed my life. And listen, if you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, I'm telling you, it's the greatest decision you'll ever make in your life. And if you'll go ahead and stand with me. I want us to worship a little bit. I think this song is just so fitting because of touch of heaven. Because that's what it took. It took a touch of heaven for me to let go of my anger and bitterness. And to surrender my life to a God. And he totally changed me. So I want us to worship a little bit. If you've never given your life to Jesus... I'm going to give you an opportunity, and if then you had something, something tragic happened to you, I'm going to give you an opportunity, and I'm going to pray over you, and we're going to do some spiritual warfare together. But let's worship a little bit real quick. Open up my heart to you. I open up my heart to you now. So do what only you. Jesus, have your way in me now. I open up my heart to you. I open up my heart to you now. So do what only you can. Jesus, have your way. 
what we receive in you. Lord, thank you for making a way when there was no way. Lord, thank you for not leaving us in our, our current situation. Did you sent your son to die on a cross for us. You were all our sickness, all our sin, all our pain, all our suffering. Everything that we go through, Jesus, we work on the cross. And thank you that by Jesus' stripes that we are healed physically, emotionally, and spiritually, that we can be made whole. With head bowed and eyes closed. You know, if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. It's hard for you to be on the delivery side of this message because you've never been on the receiving side of this message. Maybe you needed to hear today that God loves you. He does, and He sent His Son Jesus to pay for your sins. And you feel it tugging on your heart. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. The cool thing, Jesus says, but nobody comes to me unless the Father draws them. Right now, the Holy Spirit, or God's using the Holy Spirit to draw you. Like, and there's a pump, and there's something going on in your heart. That's that's your heavenly Father talking to you, calling you home, saying, "Today's your day. Today's your day to make me Lord of your life. Today's the day to ask me to throw you that lifesaver. I'm just, I'm just inviting you." Remember, ten eyes. If you confess Him as Lord, believe in your heart He is who He says He is, that you'll be saved. So I'm not going to call you out, but if you're here, the Spirit of God is tugging you. You say, Pastor, me, that's me. Would you, would you help me surrender my life to Jesus? Simply lift your hand. Thank you, Father. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your transparency and honesty. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Yes, sir. supernaturally has happened right now. Chains are about to break. Walls are about to fall. Bondages are about to be let go. Family, let's say this together. Let's say, Jesus, today, I confess you as Lord. I've surrendered my life to you as best as I know how. I believe are who you say you are, and you're the Messiah. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. And be Lord and leader. And Jesus, from this moment forward, help me to live for you. In Jesus' name. Everybody says, amen. Come on, put your hands together for those souls, new souls, a new hope, new life. Your name's written in the Lamb Book of Life. You never have to worry about your eternity. And the love of the Heavenly Father is with you. And this last is the You know, if you're dealing with something that's happened in your past that just won't let go, maybe it's not as bad as what has happened to me. Maybe it is. I don't know. But I tell you, whatever happened to you, if it's keeping you from being who God wants you to be, God wants to get rid of it. He sent Jesus to destroy the work of Satan in your life. Did you know that? He destroyed everything that Satan uses to kill, still and destroy your life. And the Bible says one will pull a thousand, two will pull ten thousand. I would love to pray for some people to say, hey, man, there's something I'm dealing with, but Pastor, if you'll just believe with me, I'll do some spiritual warfare, and then we'll worship a little bit, then we'll dismiss. But if there's anybody say, hey, that's me, Pastor B. Lift your hand, man. If that's, yes, ma'am, I'm with you. Hands all over, man. Let's pray. 
right now in Jesus' name, I come before you, Father. You tell us, God, Lord, where two or three are gathered, that you are there. Lord, you tell us that we can ask on anything according to your will, and it will be given to us, Lord. And we thank you that you're a God of health. We thank you're a God of, of the, uh, not the impossible, but you're the God of the impossible, that you tell us that we can have faith of a mustard seed, that we can tell a mountain to be uprooted and go into the ocean, and it'll go, Father. And Lord, right now, I lift up every hand that is up to you, God. Lord, we tear down every stronghold. God, we tear down every demonic spirit that has been sent to kill, steal, and destroy our life. Right now, I bind up depression. Right now, I bind up anger. Father, right now, I tear down unforgiveness. Father, right now, I tear down depression. I tear down pain right now. In Jesus' name, you have no authority. And I lose love. I lose hope. I lose success over their life. I lose the supernatural healing power of a love that surpasses, a love that will never forsake them, a love that they may receive that. May they know today that the old is gone and the new has come. May they know that you are for them and not against them. May they know that greater he that lives in them than he that is in the world. And today, behold, all things are new today, Father, that they can walk out of this place knowing that you are for them and not against them, that you can walk out of this place knowing, God, Lord, that you have forgiven them, that they, God, that they are to forget about the past and look to what you have for them. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Come on, let's worship. Come on, get your hands together. God, we worship you right now. God, in your worship, we're going to tear down the strange for We love you, Father God. Thank you.